Millions of kids across the country are heading back to school right now. My own two daughters went back to school this week. It's the fourth new school year since the coronavirus burst onto the scene and turned our world upside down. But it's the first school year since President Biden declared an end to the pandemic, since both the US and the WHO declared an end to the coronavirus public health emergency. So am I glad schools are back up and running again? Yes. Am I glad that COVID cases and hospitalizations are down from the record highs of 2022? Yes, of course. Although I should point out that COVID cases are going up again. And last week, more than 12,000 people were hospitalized with COVID in this country. COVID is not gone, and our kids in particular are still at risk of infection, of reinfection, of long-term harm, and yes, of death. Today, I want to address this thorny and very emotive issue of kids, schools, and COVID, because we have seen a blatant and bad faith rewriting of history on this issue from a lot of people who should know better. And so I think this today, what you're about to watch, is one of the most important deep dives I've ever done on this show, because the myths about children and COVID, that kids aren't really harmed by it, that school closures were a massive and avoidable mistake, that they caused learning loss and mental health issues, those myths, and they are myths, dangerous myths, have endured for so long, become so ingrained, so pervasive, that they're not just something Fox viewers believe. I'm sure many of you watching at home have sadly come to accept many of these myths as true. So we need to reassert what the actual truth of the matter is, especially if we are to be prepared for the next pandemic when it inevitably comes, and especially if we are to protect and not abandon our kids right now as they return to school. So let me start today by taking you back to the beginning of the pandemic, March 2020, when billionaire Elon Musk was tweeting on the website he didn't yet own that, quote, kids are essentially immune. It was just the beginning for Musk, who would eventually don a tinfoil hat and embrace COVID conspiracy theories, tweeting trash like, my pronouns are prosecute Fauci. But on the subject of children and COVID, he was hardly alone. A chorus of voices flooded the zone, and not just on Fox. School should be open. If you look at children, children are almost, and I would almost say definitely, but almost immune from this disease. Are we seeing higher rates of serious illness in younger unvaccinated kids such that we should be thinking of them as more vulnerable? In fact, we're not. The risk of corona, fortunately for, for students, is incredibly low. Children are less likely to become infected and they are less likely to spread infection. You don't need to fear for your children's lives. With, with COVID, it does because they're, thank God, relatively protected. The myth of kids' immunity. It wasn't true then, it's not true now. And we actually knew it was false at the very beginning of the pandemic. Just days before Elon Musk was tweeting that kids are essentially immune, peer-reviewed research of 2,000 infected children in China showed the opposite. In that survey, 125 kids, nearly 6%, developed very serious illness. One died. The evidence was there that kids were at risk, so why don't we take that risk more seriously? First, because COVID was undeniably so much more dangerous to adults and to the elderly in particular that many people just discounted the risk to kids. And second, in spring 2020, we did have lockdowns. Schools did close and other significant public gatherings were seriously limited. And yes, as a result, many children and adults were effectively protected from infection. And yet, that became a rationale for many people to assume that opening schools would be fine. To paraphrase the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in another context, that's like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. As the anti-school closure keyboard warriors typed on from their own virtual workplaces, actual frontline workers and responders in the pandemic were sounding the alarm as schools were reopened and the Delta and Omicron waves swamped America. Children's hospital wards filled up with record numbers of patients and more kids were dying. With schools open but vaccines unavailable for kids, COVID deaths among children began to grow at a far higher pace than in the first wave of the pandemic. This is what Mark Klein, physician-in-chief of Children's Hospital New Orleans, told me on this show almost exactly two years ago when I asked him about the kids aren't badly affected by COVID trope. Well, that was a myth uh, from the beginning, but it's particularly not true now. We have 18 children in the hospital today, six in the intensive care unit with a diagnosis of COVID-19. Dr. Klein was speaking at the height of a new COVID wave fueled by the Delta variant, which wasn't even the worst variant. Hospitalization rates for children at the peak of the Omicron wave were four times higher than at the peak of Delta. 
Throughout all this, many kids who were infected but lived contracted rare and dangerous inflammatory conditions. Many more developed long COVID symptoms, despite being otherwise healthy. And yes, many died. The CDC estimates that COVID has killed between 1,700 and 2,300 kids in the US. Now, the COVID contrarians, the folks who try and push back against the idea that COVID was a huge threat, that stronger mitigation measures were needed, especially the conservatives among them, have their ready response. That's not that many deaths. And sure, look, that is a small number compared to 1,138,000 Americans lost to COVID in total. But here's why everyone gets this completely wrong. You don't compare kids' deaths from COVID to adult deaths from COVID. You compare kid deaths from COVID to kid deaths from other causes, other illnesses and diseases. And when you do that, you see just how deadly COVID has been for young people in this country. A University of Oxford study found that it was the leading underlying cause of death from infectious disease for kids and the number eight cause of death for kids overall. In fact, the death rate for kids from COVID was higher than the death rates for flu and pneumonia combined. By the way, to those who say a few thousand dead kids isn't that many, how many would be too many? Put a number on it. I think the then CDC director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, said it best to a Republican senator back in 2021. I think we fall into this um, flawed thinking of saying that only 400 of these 600,000 deaths from COVID-19 have been in children. Um, children are not supposed to die. Children are not supposed to die. Ten-year-old Teresa Sperry of Suffolk, Virginia, was her fifth-grade class nurse. She hoped to be a teacher. She was not supposed to die. Neither was Jokeria Graham of Lake City, Florida, a 17-year-old high school senior who dreamed of becoming a surgeon. She was not supposed to die. Nor was Clarence Trey Johnson. He dreamed of being a rapper, but he passed away just weeks after starting eighth grade in Oklahoma City. They were all just kids. None of them were supposed to die. Oh, and when you hear conservatives in particular saying, well, the kids who died from COVID, they all had comorbidities, they were all unhealthy. A, that's not true. And B, we're supposed to be OK now with kids dying from COVID because they have asthma. And C, I guess we found those death panels that conservatives used to fearmonger about. But the thing is that the precautions we took to protect kids and close schools wasn't just about the kids. It was about protecting everyone. Kids didn't get infected in a vacuum. Even when they had no COVID symptoms, they could pass the coronavirus to other friends and family who were more vulnerable, and they did pass it on. Multiple studies over the past three years have shown again and again that kids can be vectors for COVID. They can get it and pass it on. Just this summer, a study of nearly 200,000 families here in the US over three years estimated that 70% of cases where COVID sp spread through a household started with a child in that home. 70%. That study concluded, quote, these transmissions decreased during summer and winter school breaks. Infected children, infected adults. Is that so hard to believe? Not to any parent who ever got their kid's school flu or a common cold. So if you're someone who inexplicably is not moved by the preventable deaths of thousands of kids, well, just think about how much worse it could have been for everyone in America. How many more kids and adults would have died if we hadn't closed any schools at all? Now, this may sound quaint, but when schools began closing at the start of the pandemic, it wasn't some big controversy. It was an emergency insta measure in the middle of a once in a century public health crisis. Bothell High School in Washington state was the first school to announce a temporary closure due to COVID in late February 2020. After that, it was all just a game of dominoes. By May, 48 states had ordered or recommended statewide school closures. More than 50 million public school students were suddenly out of the classroom and stuck at home. There is no school tomorrow. I am ordering the closure of all K-12 school buildings in Michigan. It would be unsafe to allow students together in schools. I will sign an ex executive order today closing K-12 through public schools for the rest of the school year. Our K-12 through schools uh, will continue with distance learning uh, for the duration of the school year. Now, today you have COVID contrarians who want you to forget that Republicans like Governors Kemp Abbott and DeSantis, who you just heard there, were doing lockdowns, or that the first governor to announce a statewide closure of schools was also a Republican, Mike DeWine of Ohio.
And they want you to forget the impact that the death of people like Desanne Romaine had on all of us. She was a high school principal at Brooklyn Democracy Academy, who was among the first educators to die from COVID in March of 2020. She was only 36 years old. They want you to forget that the American public agreed with school closures in the summer of 2020. In fact, a majority of parents, 60 percent, said it was better to delay opening schools that fall if it meant less risk of infection. 70 percent of Americans said schools needed more resources before they could open safely. The COVID contrarians want that history forgotten. And sadly, they're getting what they want. Today, the new conventional wisdom across the political and media spectrum is that closing schools was a colossal and avoidable error school closures. Now we look back and say that, that were, those are probably policies that we regret. When the decisions were made to have all the kids go home and learn remotely. Wow. Wow. What a mistake that was. Most people now look back and say, well, maybe we shouldn't have closed schools for that long. There were many mistakes during the pandemic. Um, closing schools by far was, was the worst. To say now that closing schools was a mistake, the worst mistake, makes it sound like there was a choice, that schools could have stayed open. But the truth is that in the midst of a global pandemic, it was physically impossible for schools to stay open at that time, no matter how hard they tried. In August of 2020, you kept seeing schools try to open and then have to shut down all over again. Almost 2,000 students and staff in a suburban Atlanta district had to quarantine just weeks after schools there reopened in August 2020, and three schools had to be closed again. Hamilton County Schools in Chattanooga, Tennessee, made it about a week in August 2020 before four school buildings shut down again. And in some cases, it didn't even get that far. The day before schools in Plainview, Nebraska, were set to open, the superintendent announced that they would have to delay their opening because he, the superintendent, had tested positive and had been in contact with other school employees. Were these schools closing because Anthony Fauci or Democratic governors forced them to? No. All three of those districts I just mentioned were in Republican red states. It wasn't actually possible in a lot of states and counties across America, whether red or blue, to just keep schools open when so many teachers, bus drivers, cafeteria staff, cleaning staff were getting sick and, in many tragic cases, dying. We will never know how many thousands of educators died from COVID-19. Education Week documented more than 400 teachers in the U.S. who were killed by COVID between spring of 2020 and December of 2022. This is in addition to the more than 300 school staff members who also died from the virus. And those are just the ones they were able to document. So, yes, in the midst of a global pandemic that was killing people left and right, it was not logical, nor moral, nor practical to open schools back up across the board. Now, don't get me wrong, it would have been great if our schools could have reopened earlier and more consistently nationwide during the pandemic. But some of us wanted to do that safely, carefully and with an actual plan, something Donald Trump and the Republicans just did not have. All they had were empty platitudes and angry demands. For example, in July 2020, Trump ordered on Twitter, all caps, quote, schools must open in the fall even threatened to hold federal money back from districts that stayed remote. Interestingly, though, the private school where Trump sent his own son, Barron, did not fully reopen that fall. Now, of course, Republicans have tried to argue that the evil teachers' unions are to blame for school closures. But in reality, they were the ones often most serious about schools opening, the ones who actually had a plan. In fact, in April 2020, when conservatives were busy, you know, protesting mass mandates at Target, the American Federation of Teachers, one of the biggest teachers' unions in the U.S., put out a comprehensive and detailed plan for school reopening with items like testing and tracing, personal protective equipment, sanitation stations, smaller class sizes, split scheduling, etc., etc. I am a really big believer that if it is safe and if we can make it safe, that we need to get kids back to school voluntarily over the summer and in school in the fall. That's what the much-demonized head of the American Federation of Teachers, Randy Weingarten, said in May of 2020. We need to get kids back to school. Yes, everybody, even the teachers' unions, wanted kids back in school. That's why Congress spent $190 billion over three spending bills to help public schools during the pandemic, with building improvements, with things like improved ventilation and HEPA filters. One engineering expert estimated that we could put a HEPA filter in every classroom in America for a billion dollars. We would have still had $189 billion left over. And yet, spoiler alert, there are not HEPA filters in every classroom in America.
In fact, only 28 percent of school districts said they had HEPA filters in use at the end of last year, according to a CDC survey. Perhaps even worse, almost half of the $190 billion allocated for schools in the pandemic was never spent by the states and the school districts. If you want to talk about the mistakes surrounding school closures and COVID, if you want to be angry that schools did not open back up fast enough, maybe you should direct that anger at the politicians who had no plan or the bureaucrats and local officials who didn't spend the tens of billions of dollars that was at their disposal to keep classrooms COVID free. Instead, the COVID contrarians get worked up about what they say are the disastrous educational consequences of closing schools. They say that the lockdowns irreparably harmed children's education. And they often throw around this term called learning loss. Our children have suffered severe learning loss due to school closures. The largest negative shock to student learning ever in the U.S. The pandemic is decreasing test scores, particularly in math. But that's even more so true in districts that did not have uh, in-person learning. The COVID learning loss is going to dwarf anything we usually see. The pandemic erased two decades of progress in math and reading. See, right away, I got to say, this pisses me off. The pandemic didn't do that. The way we handled the pandemic did that. You think Bill Maher is bad? Pundit Nate Silver hyperbolically compared the learning loss from the pandemic to the illegal U.S. invasion of Iraq that killed hundreds of thousands of innocent people. Look, when people talk about learning loss, they're usually talking about test scores, which for reading and for math have gone down since the pandemic began. The critics argue that remote learning was a key driver of the overall decline. But let's imagine for a moment that the critics, the contrarians, were right, that learning loss came straight from school closures. If they were right, we would expect to see the Los Angeles County Unified School District closed, it was closed until April 2021, fare much worse than major districts in Florida, which famously opened in the fall of 2020. But let's take a look. Scores in LA had been trending down for a decade, but in 2022, its scores bucked the trend. They were higher than the trend line predicted could call it a learning gain. In Florida, Miami-Dade, Hillsborough, and Duval County public schools had seen their combined scores trend up for a decade, but in 2022, they bucked their trend. They were lower. If in-person versus remote was the main driver of learning loss, you wouldn't expect to see that. Ron DeSantis was quick to brag about his state's test scores as evidence that keeping schools open was the right call. But why then did these districts, including Miami-Dade, the biggest one in his state, underperform when the largest district in California, which was closed longer, overperformed. Now, yes, those are just a few districts, but we can actually look at many districts. That's what Dr. Tyler Black from the University of British Columbia did. The COVID contrarians often point to learning loss in math, and there was an overall drop in the country, about 2 or 3%, depending on the age group. But look at in-person versus remote districts. In-person scores dropped less than remote scores. Yes, but only a little bit, actually within the margin of error. When you look at reading scores, the difference between in-person and remote is, again, within the margin of error. But the remote schools actually fared better than the in-person ones. Their loss was not as bad. Oh, and while it's true that no parent wants their kids to fall behind in subjects like reading and math, 60% of parents said in July 2020 that they would prefer that schools stay remote and minimize the risk to their kids even if they missed out on in-person learning, even if they missed out on time in the classroom. So again, let's not rewrite history here. Parents wanted schools closed, even if it cost their kids educationally. And the evidence that kids lost out educationally as a direct result of longer school closures doesn't actually exist. Now, of course, the COVID contrarians will also tell you that their vendetta against remote learning was about more than just test scores. They'll say that March 2020 marked the beginning of an alarming decline in the mental health of American children. And the chief reason for that decline in mental health was that schools were closed and kids were isolated at home. Those kept out of school the longest um, have suffered some of the worst consequences, uh, mental health consequences. Closed schools has touched off a mental health crisis for many of America's students. The mental health of our kids is really what was, you know, put most at risk during, during our school closures. We have not prioritized our kids, and now we're seeing the effect. We're seeing the mental health impact.
Yes, to the surprise of no one, this part of the COVID contrarian narrative has dominated the news, with complex studies being turned into simple attention-grabbing had headlines. Now, to be clear, nobody is denying that a once-in-a-century pandemic had an undeniable impact on the health and well-being, emotional, mental, physical, of kids across this country. But the evidence just isn't there to say that the single driver of an alleged mental health crisis was schools being closed and kids having to engage in remote learning. The folks who say this, like the people you just heard, will often point to this CDC study that looks at kids aged 12 to 17. It finds a 20% jump in suicide attempts from the summer of 2019 to the summer of 2020, and a 40% jump from the winter of 2019 to the winter of 2021. And that is hugely concerning. But the CDC caveats their study, saying that parents may have become more aware of their kids' mental health issues during the pandemic because they were all at home together, making them more likely to send those kids to the ER. And when you take a closer look at the graphs in the study, you'll notice that the amount of ER visits for suicide attempts went up during the first couple of months of 2020 for both girls and boys before the school shutdowns. But that study doesn't acknowledge the years-long trend. If you want to talk about 2020, you also need to note that rates were higher in 2019 than they were in 2018, higher in 2018 than they were in 2017, and so on. See, these rates have been trending up, sadly, tragically, well before the pandemic began. And yet it was only once schools closed that the COVID contrarian suddenly started to pay attention to our kids' declining mental health and expressed shock and horror. But here's what might surprise you. This is important. In July, researchers at the University of Texas looked at 73,000 emergency room visits for suicide attempts for kids aged 10 to 18 between 2016 and 2021. Now, they found what we just mentioned, that the rates trended upwards from 2016. Most of the time, the rate would drop during the summer and increase again in the school year. But in 2020, it wasn't during the summer break when their rates hit their low point. It was in the spring during lockdown. And when schools began reopening, those rates climbed back up. That completely contradicts the current conventional wisdom on kids' mental health and school closures. But hey, COVID contrarians don't talk about that study, do they? They do talk about this CDC study, though, quote, child and parent experiences and well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, from the name, you might think that the CDC spoke with parents and children, but they didn't. They just asked the parents how they thought their kids were doing. When they asked broadly whether their child's mental health worsened, parents of kids in remote learning were more likely to say it was getting worse. OK. But when researchers got specific and asked about depression, anxiety and psychological stress, three key areas we use when actually assessing mental health, there was little to no difference between kids in school and kids in remote learning. And on top of that, the study explicitly warns against using its results to make sweeping statements about remote learning and children. Quote, causality cannot be inferred from this study. Now, look, there are plenty of reasons that the year 2020 would have been bad for the mental health of American children, because the pandemic was staggeringly traumatic. The pandemic itself. Kids were waking up each day to pictures of mobile morgues. Children in places like New York went to sleep each night to the sound of sirens and ambulances on the street, a constant reminder of the seemingly never-ending COVID death toll. And for many children, that death toll became very personal. In New York City, one out of every 200 children lost a caregiver to COVID. As of May 2022, over a quarter of a million children across the US, over a quarter of a million lost one or both parents to COVID-19. That's right, thousands upon thousands of children in the US became orphans during the pandemic, a detail that COVID contrarians have just glossed over. Now, I'm no psychiatrist, but I'm pretty sure that losing a parent has a bigger impact on your emotional and mental health than having to learn algebra via Zoom. I haven't even touched on the amount of kids who lost friends, neighbors, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and other loved ones to the pandemic. So isn't it just bizarre to assume that in a period marked by an environment of chaos, uncertainty, instability, and mass death, that school closures were the main driver of this mental health crisis? By the way, we're expected to believe that the GOP politicians, the conservative pundits, the people who constantly call kids snowflakes, who refuse to do anything about school shootings, who defund mental health care services across the country, now suddenly care about the state of children's mental health? That's their reason for opposing school closures? Forgive me, but I don't buy it. Look, 
When you hear people today, people especially in our politics and our media say school closures were preventable, were not necessary, not popular, that's false, a lie, a myth. When you hear people say that kids aren't really affected by COVID, they're kind of immune and they don't get sick or hospitalized, they don't bring home COVID to grandma or grandpa, that's false, that's a lie, that's a myth. You want to get angry about something? Don't get angry that schools had to close because of a once-in-a-century pandemic that killed more than a million people and left hundreds of thousands of kids sick, hundreds of thousands of kids orphaned, thousands of kids dead. Get angry that we as a country failed our kids, exposed them unnecessarily to infection and even reinfection by a brand new and dangerous respiratory disease, and continue to expose them in schools that still aren't fit for purpose in an era of COVID. That is worth getting angry about.